Let's continue to talk about attitudes, but this time let's focus on how attitudes are measured. The most straightforward way to figure out and assess someone's attitude is to simply ask them about it. And that's what self-report measures are all about. So they're, they're very simple to use, they're straightforward, they're cheap. That's, those are all good things. There are some negative things associated with self-report measures. We'll talk about those soon. Let's just give an example first. So if I'm trying to figure out and assess someone's attitude regarding interracial marriage, I might just ask them flat out, do you support or oppose interracial marriage? And instead of simply giving them those two options, support or oppose, I need to realize that people's attitudes are often of varying degrees. So I might format the response option like a Likert scale. A Likert scale is simply named for the person who developed this type of technique. His last name is spelled L-I-K-E-R-T. That's why we call it a Likert scale. Now this is a modified Likert scale. Most Likert scales are agreement scales. This particular scale is based on if you oppose or support interracial marriage in this case. So you can see there are a gradient of options in here from one to five. So people might really strongly oppose interracial marriage. Maybe they're somewhere right there in the middle. So you see that three points is a neutral point. Sometimes these response scales are structured so that there is no middle point and people essentially have to pick if they support or oppose. I don't like putting people in a situation where they're forced to pick a side. Because if you force people to do something, you're not necessarily getting good data from them. You're getting the data that you have forced out of them. So these are just some of the issues that we think about when we're creating attitudinal measures. All right, so I just mentioned that self-report measures have lots of positive qualities, mostly because they're simple to use, they're cheap to use, they're very direct, very straightforward. There are some problems though. Think about even this question. If someone has some bias against interracial marriage, they might not be likely to report that to me, either face-to-face -face or even anonymous on a survey, simply due to socially desirable response biases. So the bottom line is these types of measures can be reactive and there can be problems with them as a result. It's possible that they can be a little too simplistic as well. I mean, how much can I assess interracial marriage and how someone feels about it just by asking them a question or two? Responses to these types of questions can also be biased based on the way I ask the question. So there's some great research to look at what we call framing effects. So for example, in politics, it's often that attitudinal measures will assess the extent to which people approve of particular candidates. So I can ask people a question about Hillary Clinton this way. I can say, to what extent do you approve of the job that Hillary Clinton is doing? But then I can also ask essentially the same question a little bit differently. To what extent do you approve of the job that Hillary Rodham Clinton is doing? And do you see how I referred to her in two different ways with those two different questions? Well, there are statistically significant differences in the way that people respond to those questions. So my point is simply, Yes, self-report measures are very direct, they're very straightforward, but they can also be biased by a lot of little factors. And one key factor is the way that we actually frame the question. Now, of course, we don't need to rely solely on one question to assess someone's attitude. And that's what attitudinal scales are all about. They simply are a series of questions that all focus on some particular topic. And by collecting data for a variety of different questions, we can assess someone's attitude in a more sophisticated, more complex, more complete way. So let me give you an example. This particular attitudinal scale is designed to assess if college freshmen are suited for a major in computer science. And you can see that these questions are structured more like a typical Likert scale because what we're trying to do is determine if people agree or disagree with a variety of statements. And these statements are all focusing on computer usage. So if we use a variety of questions to assess someone's attitude, the ultimate measure that we get, the final measure that we compute, tends to be more reliable overall than just simply using one single measure. Here's another way that we can improve upon typical methods with measuring attitudes. Remember with this question about interracial marriage, we sometimes worry if people are going to give us their true response. Well, it's not too common to use this technique, but it is an interesting technique. It's called the bogus pipeline, and it can be used to encourage honest responding. What it is is essentially a fake lie detection device. 
and it's based on the false claim that the experimenter has some direct pipeline into your true thoughts. So an experimenter who's using the bogus pipeline technique might set up a situation that looks like this. We'd have the research subject sitting down, able to respond um, using a variety of techniques, maybe a computer or some other device, to a series of questions. And when the experimenter asks the questions, the research subject realizes that he's hooked up to some wires and that there's a machine over here that supposedly can determine what his true attitude is. So you see, in this type of situation, the person feels like, I, I need to tell the truth. There, there's no reason for me to hide it because the machine knows the truth anyway. Social psychologists can be pretty crafty, so it's usually pretty easy to set up a situation where your research subjects believe this to be true. So again, the time that this is most beneficial is when we're asking people questions about very sensitive topics. So maybe we're asking about sex, or maybe we're asking about drug use or, or criminal behavior. Um, maybe we're asking about sensitive topics in society, like um, interracial relationships. These are situations where we might want to prompt people to be a little bit more honest than they might be otherwise. All right, well, let's move on and talk about some other ways in which we can measure attitudes. If self-report measures are very straightforward, then covert measures are really the opposite. They're not straightforward at all. And it's because when we use covert measures, we're trying to assess people's attitudes without them really knowing. We're certainly not going to ask them straight out what their attitude is. So how might we collect some data covertly? Well, let me give you a couple examples. So one way that we can get an idea of how people feel about various issues is to look and see how their head is responding. So if I was talking to you about interracial marriage, and I'm really trying to talk about how it's a beneficial thing for our society, if your head is essentially shaking up and down, it's some indication that you approve of the message that I'm giving. But if your head to some extent is shaking left and right, it's showing me that you disagree with what I'm saying. So here we're just talking about some, some small behavioral cues that give us a sense of how you're feeling. Another thing is eye contact. I'm sure you've noticed this. When you're attracted to someone, you're locking eyes with those people. So researchers who are studying things like attraction are often looking at eye contact. Another really interesting measure that I've used in the past is distance that people maintain from a person. And to some extent, that's a measurement of liking. And the way that I used it specifically was in a research study about suppressing stereotypic thoughts. And people were in a research study where they were suppressing stereotypic thoughts about a skinhead. And skinheads are violent and they're racist. And if people are thinking uh, stereotypically about a skinhead, they're gonna probably wanna stay away from that person. But if they're thinking about the person in a more open way, then they're gonna probably feel a little bit more welcoming to that person. Well, what I did was after they were engaged in my experiment, they were gonna be led to another room where they were gonna meet this person that we were learning about, this skinhead. And when they came into the room, they were able to see his belongings on a chair. And I just let them know that he stepped out for a minute to use the bathroom. And I told them to just grab a chair and then have a seat. Well, the way it was set up, they had to grab a chair and then move it into the room. And then they selected where they wanted to sit. That right there was my measurement. I then measured to see literally how far they chose to sit from that person's chair. And to some extent, that was a measurement of their attitude toward this particular stereotypic topic. If they sat further away from the person, I assumed that they were thinking more stereotypically about this person, that he was violent, that he was no good, that he was racist. But if they sat closer to the person, I assumed that they were thinking less stereotypically about him. So it's just one example of a covert measure. And you can see that people have no idea what we're measuring typically in these situations. And that's good because we don't want people to be thinking, what does the experimenter want me to say? I wanna figure out what you really feel. I don't want you to be all mixed up in trying to figure out what's going on in the research situation. Sometimes the measures are really very straightforward in terms of physiological measures. So we can measure some things that are associated with the typical polygraph, like heart rate, blood pressure, galvanic skin response. But as I discussed in an earlier video, there's no one lie response. Well, there's also no one response for love and liking or for hate and dislike. 
So even though there might be some types of changes in physiology, it's kind of hard to narrow down if those are positive feelings or negative feelings. But nonetheless, we can take a variety of physiological measures. So you can see here um, just a basic setup for a polygraph. And in any type of research situation, we can take measures of blood pressure using a cuff, heart rate using the cuff. You can see right over here, there are some tubes wrapped around this man's chest because it's measuring his respiration. One thing that people often don't notice is that there are often electrodes placed on the person's fingers, and that's what we call a galvanic skin measurement. And what we're actually measuring here is the um, electrical conductivity of the person's skin, because the more you sweat, the more conducive to electricity your skin would be. But as I noted, as interesting as these measures are, and as much as we're able to tell like how intense someone's feelings might be, we can't really determine via those measurements if the person has positive or negative feelings, positive or negative attitudes about the topic we're trying to explore via our research. So is there some way physiologically that we can measure if someone has a positive or a negative attitude about something? And there's been some really interesting research done with facial myography. And what we're doing in this situation is essentially measuring the person's muscles in their face. And I'm sure you've realized that when you smile, particular muscles are used. And if you frown or scowl, particular muscles in your face are being used. And oftentimes those muscles are triggered in such a way that you don't even realize. So you might be feeling good about some particular thing that we're talking about, even though you don't have a smile right across your face. Or you might have a negative reaction to something that we're talking about, even though you don't have a scowl. However, sensitive electrodes can pick up on that muscular activity. Now, researchers who have a lot of grant money and access to a lot of equipment, they can try to assess attitudes by looking at brain waves and uh, brain activation using CAT scans and MRIs. That's much more rare. And although that research is somewhat promising, to me personally, it's not yet quite convincing enough because it's really tough to find some consistent signal amongst all the noise that exists when we're talking about brain activation. Another way that we can assess attitudes covertly is using cognitive measures. Many cognitive measures rely on people's reaction times. Because remember, if you can react very quickly to a question, you typically have a relatively strong, firm attitude uh, regarding that particular topic. Um, so to some extent, it's predictive of how people feel when we measure how quickly they respond to particular questions. That's the exact type of reasoning behind the IAT. We discussed it previously. It's the implicit association test. Let me talk about it again, just to make sure you really understand it. You might recall that the implicit association test is based on the idea that people are unlikely to express negative racist attitudes via questionnaires, but the IAT is able to assess relatively subtle biases by measuring reaction time responses. Now the IAT is a relatively simple measure, but it can be a little bit confusing. So let me walk through this graphic and let, let's adjust this graphic as we go. Because sometimes people oversimplify what's going on here. Although people are responding as quickly as they can using their left hand and their right hand to determine if the face that they see is black or white or determine if a word that they see is good or bad, sometimes people are misinterpreting this and they might be thinking that, oh, someone's looking at this black face and then clicking on the person's bad. And that shows that the person has some type of implicit racist attitude. That's not what's going on at all. So let's, let's move a step back. So the IAT works through a series of steps. In the first step, people are shown pictures of faces. And then they use their left hand to click a button for white faces and their right hand to click a button for black faces. So this is a black face, so the person would respond as quickly as they can to show that it is a black face. They push down the button with their right hand. Then of course, some of the pictures are gonna be of white faces. In this situation, the person, as quickly as they can, they would push down on the button with their left hand. Now, in another stage of this experiment, people are going to see words, and some of those words in general are gonna be bad, and some of those words in general would be good. Happy is a good word. So this person would respond as quickly as they can with their right hand to push that button. And some of those words are relatively bad, like sad. So this person would now respond as quickly as he could with his left hand on that button. All right, now here's where things start to get interesting. This is where we're now pairing faces and words. 
So the person's either gonna see a face or they're going to see a word. If it's a black face, they're gonna use their left hand to click black. If it's a bad word, they're gonna use their left hand to click bad. So in this situation, now assume that this person holds some relatively racist views, whether they know it or not. Do you see how there's an association now between black and bad? And if I have relatively racist views, that makes sense to me. Those two things are consistent. So when I see a black face, I can really quickly with my left hand label that as a black face because not only is it a black face, but I also to some extent see that person as bad. Those things are consistent. However, again, let's assume that I have relatively racist views against blacks, but I am part of the white race and I have a relatively preferential view toward them. In this situation, the world isn't making sense to me because I'm seeing a white face, but I'm also remembering that when I see a bad word, I'm supposed to use my left hand. Do you see how those things are inconsistent? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna slow me down. And that's what reaction time measures are all about. So because I see these things as inconsistent, I'm gonna be slower to respond. And that's exactly what the IAT is measuring. How quickly or how long it takes for me to respond to various associations between races, white and black, and words, good and bad. All right, well, I hope that helps you better understand this graphic here and how the IAT is used to measure implicit attitudes about race. Well, I've mentioned before that the IAT has been getting a lot of attention, so it's reasonable to ask if the IAT is able to predict real-world racist behaviors. And in general, measurements of people's implicit attitudes are somewhat less predictive of behavior than are measurements of people's attitudes that are measured and expressed explicitly, such as through you know, questionnaires or direct interviews. But keep in mind that implicit attitudes might provide us with more insight when we're dealing with sensitive topics because there are a lot of questions that we can ask people that they don't want to answer face to face or that they don't want to answer honestly on a survey. For example, there's been some really interesting research showing that the IAT may be effective in assessing people's risk of suicide. So we still need a lot more research done with the IAT just to see how helpful it's going to be in the real world. Um, but it looks very promising. Well, my friends, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. All right, my friends, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.
All right, my friends, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.